Welcome to our live webcast, Why Risk Monitoring Matters, a practical guide for increasing visibility to potential risks. Thank you for joining us. My name is Claudia, and I'll be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you have. On the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see the text chat window. There is a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the bottom where you'll type in your questions. To send a question, click in the text box and type your text. When finished, click the Send button. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenter. Your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We are joined today by our speaker, Karen Gray, Senior Entity Due Diligence and Monitoring Specialist, LexisNexis. Karen Gray is a 22-year LexisNexis veteran. She's also a Senior EDDM Specialist. Karen serves as LexisNexis's expert and central point person for all due diligence and third-party monitoring solutions. She's a resource for benchmarking, market intelligence, strategic category management, and vendor selection, and focuses on efforts to improve profitability and cash flow, risk mitigation, and operational efficiencies with regard to vendor selection and monitoring. I'd now like to turn the floor over to you, Karen. Good afternoon, and thank you, Kathleen and all, Claudia as well. Um, thank you for the warm introduction. I would like to welcome everyone to the call today. Good morning, afternoon, and good evening, regardless of where you're calling in from. We are happy to sponsor this Thought Leadership Conference today and this webinar. Um, if you are unfamiliar with LexisNexis, let me take just a moment to introduce our company to you. We have a 44-year history in information aggregation and analysis. We have adapted to the way professionals work over the years, and we've noted quite significant changes to workflow over the last several decades. Really, there's never been a more exciting time for a veteran like myself uh, to be at LexisNexis. We have globalized our own efforts to provide our customers the legal and regulatory and business information and analytics necessary for the performance of making better decisions and increasing productivity. LexisNexis Legal and Professional is part of Relex Group, formerly known as Reed Elsevier. Um, we have more than 175 countries with our operations, and we employ more than 10,000 people worldwide. Le Relex Group is a world-leading provider of information and analytics uh, for professionals and business customers across various industries. So with that, let's get started. LexisNexis, along with ISM, brings to you today the topic of why monitoring matters, the risk monitoring imperative. In recent years, we have noticed a persistent rise in anti-corruption, anti-bribery, and other regulations and guidelines aimed at businesses across a wide range of industries. And as a result, businesses are facing higher levels of risk. That risk is inclusive of legal, financial, and reputational consequences. This risk can begin if third-party relationships are not adequately vetted and monitored throughout the lifetime of contractual agreements. Today, we're going to explore some ongoing challenges and new lines of defense, including the evolving landscape of third-party due diligence, whether your third parties include suppliers, contractors, agents, or acquisition targets. We at LexisNexis realize that faced with complex global third-party networks, it is more critical than ever for you to have an effective strategy for evaluating and monitoring third-party risk. So we'll wrap up our call with some recommendations and discuss PESTLE risk-based scoring and monitoring to ensure that you have insights necessary to avoid financial and reputational harm. We've seen, again, a reputational risk rise by the numbers. There are many reasons that support this fact. Thanks to the input from hundreds of compliance leaders from around the world, we have insight as to the perceived strengths and weaknesses of risk programs today. Globally recognized experts from Kroll partnered with Ethisphere, and they launched a survey to a global audience back in November of 2016. Now, they asked a variety of questions about third-party due diligence, 
stakeholder engagement, and merger and acquisition activity. A collection of 388 qualified responses from senior level executives working in ethics, compliance, and or with anti-bribery and corruption from both public and private global companies hailing from a dozen industries, they helped to shape this presentation today. So consider this, 57% of the survey respondents expect their organization's risk to persist at the same levels as last year. 35% expect increased risk, while only 8% expect a decreased risk this year. By definition, reputational risk is a risk of loss resulting from damages to a company's reputation, either in lost revenue, increased operating, capital, or regulatory costs, or destruction of shareholder value, consequence to an adverse or potentially criminal event, even if the company is not found guilty. So consider, cons consider reputational risk as a threat or a danger to the good name or standing of a business or an entity. And that could also be indicative of reputational risk that is aligning with one of the principles of an organization that you do business with. Now this risk can occur in a number of different ways, directly as the result of actions of the company itself, indirectly due to the actions of an employee or a group of employees, or through peripheral parties, third parties, joint ventures, partners, suppliers, as it were. In addition to monitoring media for negative news mentions of third parties, companies are recommended to implement ongoing risk-based monitoring. Companies in highly regulated industries, for example, may already monitor for compliance risk, but they also need to track the regulatory rulemaking environment to understand how compliance risk may change as new policies and guidance comes to light. Let's take a look at a case study. Last year, or earlier this year, Business Insider published an article on the smartphone batteries that we all enjoy on a daily basis. And I say enjoy. I would be well within my rights as a customer to say that my battery doesn't last quite as long as, as I hope, given the end of the day. But there are significant examples of things like conflict minerals with regard to our smartphone batteries that we enjoy. The Democratic Republic of Congo is key because this is where a lot of that mining goes on for things that go in lithium batteries or ionic batteries. Apple says that it's working to end child labor in all of the cobalt mines, so much so that they've added cobalt to a list of their conflict minerals. And Apple has partnered with a number of NGOs to focus on the DRC particularly. particularly. They are quoted as saying that there's absolutely no excuse for anyone under the legal working age to be in their supply chain. And the company says that in their most recent Supplier Responsibility Progress Report. Now, batteries for our phones is not just Apple's problem, of course. Any phone company that needs lithium-ion batteries is ultimately sourcing much of its cobalt through the DRC. But because Apple makes the single most popular phone model on the planet, it does get the brunt of criticism. Now, Samsung has been a little less specific about what it's doing. They were criticized in 2016 by Amnesty for sourcing cobalt from the DRC. Samsung promised to investigate, and they issued a statement. We will share the report of upstream supply chain of cobalt on our website by the end of 2016. The company issued that statement in March. They are, they are furthermore quoted to say that we will not only engage in joint initiatives for sustainable supply chain of cobalt, but also take measures to secure transparency and human rights with our suppliers through continuous monitoring of the supply chain. As of May of this year, so some 15, 16 months later, Samsung had not published the report on its social responsibility site. However, by check of today, 
they have made an attempt with over a hundred and so pages of this particular addressed issue on their social responsibility site. Like the media or not, media sometimes has a way of pressuring larger companies where responsibility for responsible um, ethical sourcing is the crux of their very core of their business. Now, Apple has gone on to fix steps in their mining business. They recognize that there are challenges with regard to mining of cobalt, but they can't walk away from it. There are communities that rely on, mon uh, on mining uh, for their income, and frankly, Apple needs the cobalt. So their company is working to end child labor and human rights abuses in the mining community. One further point here, number to take into con consideration, there are about 40,000 children that are mining cobalt in the DRC, and that's according to Amnesty. Part of that mining initiative is looking at the runoff of these mines because it is poisoning the local water supply. The challenge with the cobalt industry, as it were, with reputational risk, is that cobalt is taken to open-air markets where Chinese buyers give the locals a price. The cobalt is then traded through a chain of Chinese suppliers. And according to a recent Washington Post article, it reaches Apple and Samsung and all the other phone makers. So the opaque chain of transparency is dimmer and darker. There's no single phone company today that can be tied directly to one of the Congolese cobalt mines. So when we start to look at surfacing reputational risk, we also must take into consideration the transparency or what the Washington Post coins, the opaqueness of our supply chain. So what if you're not in a highly regulated industry? Chances are better than average that your third parties are in highly regulated industries, and that's where the risk lies. When we start to look at the rise of reputational risk, Social compliance has put pressures on companies. Those pressures can stem from NGOs, non-governmental organizations, consumer groups, and consumers themselves, all calling for adherence to ethical business practices. Furthermore, those pressures require that the same adherence from suppliers and third parties are transparent throughout the organization. Laws like the UK Modern Slavery Act or California's Transparency in Supply Chain Act. Those serve to increase the pressure. The increased visibility, and I quote, that the always-on media, end quote, affords, combined with greater awareness of things like forced labor, workplace safety, eco-sustainability, and more, means that companies now must address the traceability along their supply chains to meet not only regulators' expectations, but the public expectations as well. Protecting corporate and brand reputation has long been a risk consideration. But the Harvard Business School's Working Knowledge blog notes, in this hour of 24-hour information, the traditional news cycle is long, dead, and buried. Assume information will get out sooner rather than later, and as Lynn Shulman, National Crisis Directory for Magnet Communication in New York says, it's most likely going to hit sooner. She further comments, you have to think that everything your company does will reach the outside world. Well, a new era of corporate leaders are sensitive to this shift. In a 2017 anti-bribery and corruption benchmarking report, reputational concerns have moved from the least likely to the most likely reason for a third party to fail vetting standards in just one year. And they are right to be concerned because it's not just regulators that are watching. Consumers are paying attention as well. And when consumers lose trust, whether it's due to a data breach, a product recall, some sort of regulatory or social compliance failure, consumers will speak with their wallets. So what are the ongoing challenges and new lines of defense that we see? 
organizations today are facing an evolving array of risks, as we mentioned prior. Corporate boards and executive leaders, again, are feeling the pressure. According to a global survey of board members and C-suite executives, they are quoted as saying, the impact of the UK Brexit vote, increased volatility in commodity markets, polarization surrounding the recent U.S. presidential election, terrorist events, asset bubbles in China, continued discussion about fair wages and income equality, and ongoing instability in the Middle East have all resulted to elevated concerns about business risk in 2017. Moreover, companies rely increasingly on third parties to conduct business from complex, globally distributed supply chain to an extensive network of clients, partners, or agents working on their behalf. How vast are these networks? 40% of companies oversee 1,000 third parties annually. 29% manage more than 5,000 third parties, third-party relationships. So my question, think about where you sit on this scale and the size of your third-party risk and the exposure to risk that you may see with your third parties. Now, these numbers don't include your customers. As a result, companies need a risk mitigation strategy that goes beyond traditional due diligence for onboarding suppliers and third parties. The Kroll report that I cited earlier found that more than half, 55% of their respondents, reported that they identified legal, ethical, or compliance issues with a third party after due diligence had been conducted. So it's safe to say that ongoing monitoring can help you build a more complete picture of risk exposure and proactively mitigate risk. Now, your due diligence processes need to align with your strategic, financial, regulatory and reputational risks that your organization may face and those similar goals. This is especially true for organizations that do business with third parties and countries that attract high levels of regulatory scrutiny or for organizations doing business with privately owned entities. But consider this, 70 to 80% of one's supply base is private. And given that 69 percent of newly formed private companies survive two years or less, proper vetting is a major emphasis for sourcing organizations, and the mandate for monitoring is imperative, especially when you enter in multi-year agreements. Now, the global nature of business today subjects enterprises to a growing number of regulations and a greater need to mitigate that risk exposure through those business partners and third parties. What happened to the days of simply running a credit report and issuing a PO for goods and services? Those days are gone. One of the greatest challenges faced by procurement professionals today is not only the large number of federal and state regulations, but the rapid pace at which those regulations change. Now, after a basic level of vetting has taken place, including verifying of or the verification of self-reported data, prospective third parties, whether it's a company or an individual, should be subjected to watch list screening processes. By conducting watch lists or PEP checks early in the process, companies can quickly determine if the potential third party relationship poses a significant risk. That threshold of acceptability is certainly defined by your own internal work process, your own governance boards, your own C-suite. But again, what is that threshold of acceptability when we're aligning that to the definition of the posing of a significant risk? Now, you can comply with increase in defensibility, or your company can do that against any sort of monetary penalties, government sanctions, um, civil or criminal suits or enforcement actions, any sort of regulatory imposition if you're found to be working with an, uh, an individual or an entity that appear on any number of watch lists, be prepared to serve up an audit trail or a line of your 
uh, research that you've done in, in using that tool to either um, disengage with a third party or continue or engage with a third party. So where do all of these lists originate? Government sanctions and watch lists are generated from multiple authorities, both domestic and international. There are upwards of 800 various watch lists that originate from more than 75 countries. Some of the more commonly lists are known as OFAC, FBI Most Wanted, Debarred Companies, Interpol, the OCC, Office of, of uh, Comptroller of the Currency, EU Designated Terrorists, and even FINRA. But some of those lesser known lists include companies that are involved in slave labor or white collar crime, stock manipulation, or disqualified directors. Ethical sourcing hinges on your organization's efforts to stay alert to government sanctions, watch lists, and PEPs to mitigate the risks of conducting business with unethical third parties. Active monitoring helps us to ensure that you are aware of any potential problems before they put your organization at risk. Now, business needs change, albeit. So commit yourself to recurrent reviews with your stakeholders your uh, commission teams, uh, your compliance uh, stakeholders as well, to ensure that your due diligence and monitoring processes are always aligned to those needs over time. Now let's agree that the landscape of third-party due diligence is definitely evolving. Mitigating risk is a top concern regardless of who you are, especially given the evolving regulatory environment and the leap that we see represented by this slide in enforcement actions. Trace International issued a 2016 GER report, Global Enforcement Report, and they found a significant year-over-year -year increase in the number of U.S. and non-U.S. enforcement actions related to bribery of foreign officials. In the U.S., for example, the number of enforcement actions was doubled that of the previous year. In non-U.S. jurisdictions, the Trace International Organization reports, and I quote, European countries remain at the forefront of this trend, and together they account for 42% of all open investigations. That's compared to 46% being conducted by the U.S., the UK remains the leader within Europe with 29 open investigations, and Germany follows suit with 17 open investigations. You say, well, where are those investigations happening? Well, the GER, the Global Environmental or Enforcement Report, revealed that the industries most affected were engineering, construction, extractives, manufacturing, and services. Those are the industries that are most vulnerable to non-U.S. actions as related to domestic enforcement. So, again, we mentioned the Apple case scenario earlier um, where we have extraction at the paramount of um, how Apple uh, maintains its business model and also the need for perhaps a conflict mineral. Foreign enforcement, on the other hand, targets extractives again, uh, being the leader, being the most vulnerable, with engineering, construction, transportation, and communication are close behind. The president of Trace International is Alexandra Rage, W-R-A-G-E, and she states that the United States has been concluding enforcement actions at an unprecedented rate. Other jurisdictions have been stepping up their prosecution rates as well, and with the new anti-corruption laws, that continue to be passed worldwide, she sees um, uh, good news, if you will. She continues on that she says that there may be some short-term fluctuations in these trends, but she believes that this represents continued development for a global consensus that transnational bribery will not be tolerated. Now, banks and other financial service providers have an anti-money laundering component. Their compliance requirements are going to vary a bit, but they need to consider that some of these issues will sometimes overlap with social compliance issues 
because the proceeds from forced labor and human trafficking may be involved. There was a report issued by the Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies, and they note that banks can monitor negative media related to the existence of their branch networks. The extent to their geographic footprint is based on any sort of defined financial crime priorities. Um, agreed, there are places on the planet that are susceptible to more financial crime than not. But it also helps these institutions to spot signs of human trafficking. There are several reports issued on slavery, modern slavery, as it were, um, in different industries, and which countries are the most responsive and which countries are the least responsive to that, um, to that issue of human trafficking. So what's the takeaway? Well, monitoring the FCPA is certainly one. Monitoring the UK Bribery Act, Modern Slavery Acts, and other like acts Certainly we've seen that at the state level with the California Supply Chain Transparency Act as well. But any of these acts further illuminate the chinks in any of our third parties' armor. Make note, these investigations are long, they are complicated, but the fines associated with those noncompliance actions, they are real and they are distracting to effective management of a company. In 2016, for example, the top 10 U.S. FCPA, Foreign Corruptive Practices Act, the top 10 cases incurred penalties of $4.65 billion. Let me repeat, $4.65 billion for bribing officials worldwide. That doesn't take into account the amount of money that was used to bribe the individuals. Um, in the white paper that we are going to make available to you at the end of the session, there is a chart. But verbally, let me tell you, there are some well-known companies on the top 10 FCPA financial penalties list that we are knowing in this market space. Siemen holds the number one spot out of Germany with fines of $800 million. That investigation took more than six years, and they paid more than $1.4 billion in over 4,200 corrupt payments to foreign officials. Alstom out of France, another $772 million fine. Tens of millions over more than a decade. KBR out of the U.S. in conjunction with Halliburton payouts over nine years, defense contractors, um, Total, which is also in a regulated industry in the oil and gas space. So years and years of bribing officials sums up to, at least in these top 10, $4.65 billion of fines. Now, I assume that those fines go back to pay people um, that are trying to conduct the fine. You may look at this graphic here and think, well, gosh, Karen, only 30 cases in 2016. But you have to know that those cases take years and years of investigation. The unfortunate scenario that we find ourselves in is that there's just not enough manpower for investigative motions as there are people that are trying to increase the profitability bribing officials, forcing payments into the hands of those folks that are politically exposed and those that are heads of state and, and whatnot. When we start to look at supply chain disruption, whether it's these enforcement actions of the FCPA or, FCPA or others, the British Standards Institute, for example, found that supply chain disruption for 2015 added up to more than $56 billion. What did that risk look like? Cargo theft? migration crises, terrorism, extreme weather conditions, labor unrest, health pandemics, even natural disasters. So all that to say there are a number of factors that go into this landscape of how this is evolving and how we can be more aware. How do we justify that? How do we get our C-suite owners to increase their budget line, their budget line items with that? Well, we can talk about more at that at the end of the call, but certainly best practices 
um, are out there with regard to white papers. We share some of those with you in the white paper at the end of this session. Now, we recommend a PESTLE-based scoring. This model is a risk-based scoring. It helps companies analyze their own strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Not only is LexisNexis, not only do we have a third-party supply chain, but we are also a provider of goods and or services. So we expect to be in the due diligence motion and the monitoring motion for our clients that we work with because oftentimes we are seen as a third party. So when we start to look at the pestle in our own four walls and we start to apply that in our own risk modeling, how can we help other companies spot relevant information sooner? When we look at PESTEL, in no way are we stating that this replaces the risk that you assess by either tier or spend or criticality or any risk associated maybe with a single source supplier. However, PESTEL risk-based scoring can be a complement or a supplement to any number of internal risk controls or risk assessments inside of your organization. A risk-based approach to monitoring, in fact, offers a strategic advantage given the sheer volume of news and industry and country and legal and regulatory data that merits ongoing consideration. Onboarding, onboarding due diligence, let's say it again, onboarding due diligence alone is not enough to mitigate risk. We have to be proactive in our risk monitoring to processes that complement any sort of conventional financial risk scoring to better anticipate supplier and or third-party risk on a continuing basis. Now, companies can't afford to let down their guard. Let's talk about PESTEL at a more granular level. Risk angles represent different groups. Uh, groups of activities that can be classified, and we've done so with the acronym P-E-S-T-L-E. So we've grouped these, commonly referred to in at least our space as PESTEL. So when we start to view risk categories that let you focus on your risk mitigation efforts and the types of risk that you're encountering most frequently, we find by definition P stands for political. This category covers geopolitical risk associated with an entity. So when we start to think about political risk, think about import, export, political violence, newly formed dictatorships, war, energy policies, embargoes, sanctions, and the like. Um, and when I say political risk, let's consider where you might have a call center or a manufacturing facility or volatility of a political climate somewhere. Monitoring political risk can save not only your physical assets, but your personnel as well. Now, E is for economic. This category could cover everything from layoffs to bankruptcies. It might cover macroeconomic issues like recession that may impact an entire industry. So when you're looking for that financially slanted document or looking beyond a credit score, monitoring economic conditions for not only third parties but their competitors and their industries are no less important. Ask yourself how many times you've needed to place a contingency supplier on hold and we have to find a contingency supplier because we have a failed incumbent supplier. S is for societal. This covers everything with regard to the entity's corporate code of conduct. So whether that is their reputation or yours, we're looking for um, sourcing ethically. We're looking for product recalls, labor violations, any sort of human rights violations, health and safety issues. So as we stated before previously, reputational concerns have moved from the least likely to the most likely as reasons for third parties to fail. When we look at T in our PESTEL acronym here, we're looking at technical, cyber theft, port closures, inventory management, price increases, hacking, spinoffs. Uh, think about technical risk representing the operational risk of a third party. And other examples of this could include things like obsolescence of a fleet or a plant or waning technology. 
Now, L is for legal. This can cover legal issues from regulatory issues to lawsuits to money laundering to any sort of misappropriations of funds, fraud, patent infringement, things of that nature. Legal issues have always been a distraction to efficiency. They are costly, they are more complicated, and they are drawn out certainly over time. Let's not discount pending litigation and out-of-court settlements as indicators of disruption on an entirely different scale. And lastly, we have environmental. This includes issues like natural hazards or oil spills, tsunamis, tornadoes, uh, water quality, pollution, avalanches, anything from a natural or a man-made phenomena. While natural disasters are one thing and seemingly out of our immediate control, monitoring the environmental footprint left as a result of a man-made negligence is even more so critical. I'm going to issue, issue a quote here in closing from the U.S. Foreign Corruptive, uh, U.S. Uh, USFCA, uh, the, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Companies should, quote, undertake some form of ongoing monitoring of third-party relationships. Where appropriate, this may include updating due diligence periodically, exercising audit rights, and providing periodic training, requesting annual compliance certifications, even still by a third party. The PESTEL risk-based scoring model goes much beyond basic due diligence. Enhanced due diligence involves a more maturing level of monitoring in line with your organization's strategic goals and efforts to minimize your organization's exposure to risk. I know that we've lost a bit of time today, but one of the things that we want to encourage you to do, if you so fell led, there is a polling question here. Would you like to receive a complimentary copy of the supporting LexisNexis white paper that we have introduced as the basis of our presentation today. It's a simple yes or a no thank you. When you answer that, you certainly can uh, expect then a copy of the presentation to your uh, provided email address. Um, we are at the top of the hour. I want those that had submitted questions to feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, one of the questions that was submitted early on, what is PEP? Um, if she is still online, politically exposed people. Um, there are lists of sanctions that we can provide to you. Some of those questions came in and said, hey, do you have a list of all those authorities of sanctions? We certainly could provide that to you. Um, if you're looking at the presentation, my contact information on email um, is also available. I'm happy to attend to any of your questions that you want to send online. But I do want to honor the present. I want to pay homage to those of you that stuck with us through the hour. We, I know, apologize on all fronts for the delay in, and, and the gap in, in the middle. So um, I will turn it back over to our moderator. Claudia, are you with us to round out our, our, our session? Yes, thank you so much. And on behalf of the Institute for Supply Management and LexisNexis, I'd like to thank you for your participation in today's event. This does conclude the program. Thank you, and have a great day.